Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Hart Beatty, and welcome to our next session of the APVR National Virtual Noon Conference. Um, I, uh, again, I chair the Education Committee for the APVR, and I am the Neuroradiology Fellowship Director here at Boston Medical Center, and I want to welcome everybody to another uh, really exciting session um, in our series. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Once again, um, the webinar is being recorded and is hosted on the APDR YouTube channel to view uh, for free on demand anytime. Um, as you log into the webinars, you know your microphones will be muted to ensure optimal quality. And if you do have questions for our presenters, we ask that you use the question and answer tool in the Zoom platform. And uh, our speakers will hopefully try to get to them uh, either through a private message or um, be able to answer some of them at the end of their talk uh, if there's time remaining. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today. We are so honored uh, to have uh, Dr. Isabel Cortapazzi from Yale School of Medicine. She's the uh, Associate Program Director for the Residency and Associate Professor of Radiology. She'll be speaking on MRI of non-ischemic cardiomyopathies and uh, delighted to have Dr. Jeffrey Rubin uh, from Duke University, um, unbelievably decorated in so many spaces in radiology and leadership. And uh, today he'll be uh, in his clinical space uh, and speaking to uh, aortic, uh, acute aortic syndrome. So without further ado, um, uh, again, I'd like to thank both of you and invite Dr. Cortopazzi to uh, share her screen and begin her session. Excellent. So we'll be talking about MRI in non-ischemic cardiomyopathies today. As you said, my name is Isabel Corupasi from uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, conflicts of interest, I just have editor and Elsevier. So the lecture will comprise of, we'll touch bases on the types of cardiomyopathies. Then we we'll talk about the role of MRI and then go over some typical findings of common non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. So cardiomyopathy, as the name says, is a disease of the myocardium. It's a heterogeneous group of disease that is associated with some mechanical and or electrical dysfunction. It may be accompanied by ventricular hypertrophy or dilatation. There are several etiologies, including genetic causes, coronary artery disease, infection, or systemic disorders that can affect the heart. Uh, there are two main classifications from the American Heart Association and European Society of Cardiology. The top 1A is the American Heart Association. You have, they divide in primary cardiomyopathies that involve predominantly the heart. It can be genetic, like HCM or ARVC, mixed, like dilated cardiomyopathy, or acquired, inflammatory or systemic. And then systemic ones that affect the heart would be things like amyloidosis or uh, sarcoidosis. The European Society of Cardiology divides differently. They classify them as hypertrophy, dilated, ARVC, restrictive, or unclassified. So we'll go over in the way that the American Heart Association describes, and we'll focus on these ones. The primary ones we'll talk about includes dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, or ARVC, and myocarditis. The dilated is a mixed type. HCM and ARVC are genetic, and myocarditis is an acquired primary. Secondary ones will touch bases is amyloidosis, which is an infiltrative cardiomyopathy, and sarcoidosis, which is an inflammatory. So cardiac MRI is the gold standard already for evaluating ventricular volumes, myocardial mass, and quantitative function. It's also the gold standard for evaluating the right ventricle, but I think the most important feature when dealing with patients with cardiomyopathy is that MRI technique has great tissue characterization like in other parts of the body, the liver, the brain. We have T1 and T2 signal that can help, but late gadolinium enhancement, LGE, plays a fundamental role in patients with cardiomyopathy. And the, main, the first thing you can do is differentiate ischemic versus non-ischemic causes of cardiomyopathy. It can also, so it makes the diagnosis of cardiomyopathy by looking at the size and function of the ventricles. It delineates the etiology and the extent of disease. It also has prognostic value and allows sequential follow-up. The late gallium enhancement, as hopefully you all have heard of and know a little bit about, 
It's a gradient echo technique with an inversion recovery pulse. Usually we perform that sequence 10, 15 minutes after the first pass perfusion, injection of gadolinium, the normal myocardium washes out and scar of normal myocardium retains gadolinium. Gadolinium shortens T1 and that's what we're looking for in the image. Uh, the gadolinium is an extracellular medium, so it does not affect intact myocardial cells, they're peptide together. But when you have cell death, um, there is disruption of the membrane and the gadolinium gets inside. Or if you have anything that increases the extracellular space. For reference, what we're not looking for, so this is a CAD enhancement or coronary artery disease delayed enhancement. The coronary arteries run in the epicardial fat and then perfuse the myocardium. So any obstruction on that vessel, it has to affect the subendocardium and it can extend all the way to be transmural. So first step when assessing an LGE in patients with cardiomyopathy, is it coronary artery disease? It always involves the endocardium and is restricted or limited to coronary territories. If that's not the case, then you're thinking about non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. We we'll touch bases on one by one now, starting with primaries. So the first one we're gonna talk about is dilated cardiomyopathy. What happens is you have left ventricular dilatation, very thin myocardium and depressed systolic function. Uh, the most common cause of dilated cardiomyopathy is actually ischemia, but since we're talking about non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathies, you have to think about idiopathic, familial, peripartum, infection, toxicity. And when advances or it's very severe, the ventricle is severely dilated with severely depressed function, you have stagnant blood and you have apical thrombus formation in these patients as well, which cardiac MR can help you look at it. Fibrosis is also a very important component in, in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. It can be seen as late gallina enhancement representing irreversible replacement fibrosis, but you can also have this diffuse interstitial fibrosis that you can see abnormalities on T1 mapping. Most common, the patients do not have late gallina enhancement, so it's a normal, and it can be confusing sometimes. So what people we do routinely at our institution is we routinely add T1 and T2 mapping when evaluating all cardiomyopathies, because even if they have a normal LGE sequence, they can have abnormal T1 and T2 relaxation times. About 30% will have late gabolin enhancement, and it's most commonly mid, mid myocardial or mid wall in the septum, the interventricular septum. A very small percent of patients can have subendocardial, which can confuse with um, ischemic disease, so pay attention on that distribution of the coronary territory. Late gallin enhancement is an independent predictor of mortality and morbidity in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, and it is associated with increased risk of major adverse cardiac events. So it's very important to assess and quantify it. This is a patient with cardiomyopathy. You can see on the top left, short axis through the middle of the ventricle, you have dilated left ventricle, dilated right ventricle, and very uh, severely depressed systolic function, very low contractility. On the bottom right, you have a two-chamber view. You see the same thing, dilated ventricle, reduced contractility, myocardial wall is thinned. When you look at the late enhancement of this patient, it's normal, which is the most common. This was alcohol-related dilated cardiomyopathy. But this is another patient, and when you can see the classic mid-myocardial delayed enhancement in the septum, Normally we have a little bit of volume averaging at the base, but this is mid ventricle. So this is real when you can see on the four chamber, mid myocardial delayed enhancement. It can also be more mid wall to epicardial location like this. And you can see on the four chamber, the same uh, hyper enhancement. Holiday and, um, and its group, they, they published an article in Jack Cardiovascular Imaging talking about how uh, in dilated cardiomyopathy, the presence of septal LGE is associated with that increase of death and sudden cardiac death, even if it's a small extent. And they also uh, realized that the risk increases in its greatest when you have involvement of both the septal wall and the free wall. The next one we're going to talk about is uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a genetic disease. And you have abnormal sarcomas and myofilaments in the myocardium. It is the most common genetic heart disease. 
and is the most common cause of sudden death in young adults. Usually the patients are asymptomatic, but 75 to 95% have abnormal EKG, and severe disease may lead to symptoms such as such chest pain, snea, syncope and palpitation. MRI is more sensitive than echo in diagnosing these usual or apical sites of hypertrophy. LGE is again associated with sudden cardiac death and tachycardias, ventricular tachycardias, and it will affect the decision of ICD placement. MRI can also show the abnormal flow dynamics that we see in these patients. So normally we have a hyperdynamic left ventricle, which means instead of depressed function is somewhat elevated function, the ejection fraction tends to be higher than 60%. Uh, you have LV hypertrophy, and you always have to exclude other causes like hypertension, aortic stenosis, or infiltrative cardiomyopathies. It can be concentric diffuse, it can be asymmetrical septal, or it can be apical. And that apical one is, is a particular one on MRI, it's better, much better than echo. Uh, you can also see the LVOT obstruction. So what happens in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that you can have muscular obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract. You can also have, in addition to that, or separately, an abnormal flow with SEM, which is systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve that may lead to mitral valve regurgitation and obstruction of the LVOT. The classic LGE that we see is at insertion points of the right ventricle and within areas of myocardial hypertrophy, usually patchy mid-myocardial, but it can progress to be transmural later. So on the left, you have a diastolic picture and a systolic picture, top and bottom. You can see how there is obliteration of the chamber during systole. You see how the myocardium is diffusely thickened, uh, but more so in the apex. Here's the cl classic ace of spades with obliteration of the apex for apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And on the delayed enhancement, you see these patchy mid-myocardial areas of high signal. This one is a more diffuse concentric hypertrophy. And we can see here at the left ventricular outflow tract below the aortic valve, there is acceleration of flow with this jet from dephasing spins. And that's been secondary to systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve that is sucking in because of the high velocity of that flow. On the delayed enhancement, you have the classic hyper signal at the insertion point of the right ventricle into the septum, as well as this patchy mid myocardial areas of enhancement. This is a asymmetric septal hypertrophy. You can see the very thickened muscle in the basal to mid septum. You can see that there is actually no SEM, but there is flow acceleration. And in this case, is due to, uh, there's a little bit of SEM, cordial SEM at the tip. So it's a combination of muscular and SEM causing LVOT, and the delayed enhancement is dispatchy mid-myocardial areas of signal in the hypertrophic myocardial. We always do also a three-chamber view in phase contrast imaging, so you can see here how there is aliasing due to flow acceleration in the LVOT region. Another primary cardiomyopathy, non-SEM cardiomyopathy is ARVC. It happens due to a mutation um, the genes that decode for proteins in the desmosomes, which leads to early cell death, and then this fiber fatty replacement of the myocardium. Patient can have an early presentation, they are asymptomatic, which is called the concealed phase, but they are at risk of sudden cardiac death, or they can present already with arrhythmias on this over electrical phase. Uh, and this is, this is responsible for 15 to 25% of sudden cardiac death in patients younger than 35 years old, so it's very important to diagnose. Should be considered as a cause of any patient that presents with syncope or cardiovascular collapse. And the diagnosis is based on task force criteria. MRI itself can fulfill one major or minor criteria. So this is the modified task force criteria. There are several features that you take in consideration. You need two measures or one major and two minors. So if you look at MRI imaging, MRI, you can see abnormality of the wall, contractility, and an enlarged ventricle or uh, decreased function. Same thing for the minor. The main difference is how enlarged and how decreased the function is to become a major or minor. But importantly, you need to have this regional akinesis, dyskinesis, or dyssynchronous contraction. That has to be present. It's important to take 
particular attention to the triangle of dysplasia when you look in a cardiac MR, which is the RV free wall all the way to the RVOT. So doing an RVOT view will be helpful. You will see an enlarged ventricle that doesn't contract well, systolic dysfunction, regional or motion abnormality. It can even have focal aneurysms. So this is a, a four chamber and short axis of a patient with ARVC. You can see that the right ventricle is dilated. There is low contractility and you also have dyskinesis, focal area of dyskinesis that you can appreciate on the lateral free wall. This is another patient with the classic, I'm sorry, with the classic accordion sign, which is this corrugated appearance of the ventricle. Usually you don't see that and it's akinetic on the scene. You can sometimes see the late enhancement involving the right ventricle in patients with ARVC, but it's not a part of the task force criteria even though if you see that, it's, it's very likely to be ARVC. And FAT, which used to be a criteria for ARVC, no longer is. Next one, we talk about myocarditis, which uh, stands for myocardial inflammation, most commonly from an infection that is most commonly viral. Uh, usually, it's an otherwise health patient presenting with new onset of dilated cardiomyopathy. They can have chest pain, elevated troponin, EKG changes, but the coronary areas are normal. What we look for on MRI is the presence of edema. So you do a T2 sequence to look if there is any increased water signal. You can also see focal diffuse myocardial enhancement or hyperemia right after you inject contrast. And you can look at that late double enhancement that usually would show patchy subepicardial high signal, but also could be mid myocardial. And that LGE initially is due to edema, but it may evolve into fibrosis later on. And it's the best independent predictor of sudden cardiac death. Nowadays, this early enhancement ratio um, of hyperemia has a less important role, and T2 sequence has pretty much been replaced by T2 mapping. Another useful tool that we use is T1 mapping, native and post contrast. And more recent studies have shown that combination between LG T1 and T2 mapping may be the best way to identify acute myocarditis. And in chronic myocarditis, late colon enhancement alone has better accuracy than T1 mapping, but the accuracy increases when they are combined. We have the classic Lake Lewis consensus criteria for myocarditis. You need to have two out of three. T2 uh, signal of myocardial to skeletal muscle ratio more than 1.9. That T1 post contrast ratio more than four and delayed enhancement in a typical subepicardial mid myocardial distribution. This is a patient with acute myocarditis. On the top, you have a T2 map. You see areas of high signal in the infralateral basal, lateral wall here and here. And you also have corresponding um, delayed enhancement, which is mid myocardial patchy in the basal infralateral wall, mid myocardial here. And actually, when you go more distally, it's epicardial. So in this case, the patient has both, he has mid myocardial and epicardial areas of delayed enhancement. Another patient with focal epicardial delayed enhancement and another patient with diffuse mid myocardial delayed enhancement. Uh, it's recommended that MRI should be performed in patients with clinically suspected myocarditis. It can accurately assess left ventricular size function, look for the myocardial inflammation and any associated myopericarditis with cardiac effusion and thickening. And it's also a device that if the patient has a normal cardiac MRI initially to repeat in one to two weeks because you want to look for that um, delayed enhancement later on. The next cardiomyopathy is amyloidosis. As you all know about amyloidosis, you have this deposition of amyloid throughout the body, including the heart as well. This is a secondary cardiomyopathy, meaning it secondarily affects the heart. The prognosis depends on the type of amyloid and the extent of cardiac disease is very important for prognosis as well as systemic involvement. In the heart, it tends to involve the muscles, the myocardium, the atria, the conduction systems, and the valves. Patients present with progressive congestive heart failure and arrhythmias. On MRI, we'll see a restrictive type of cardiomyopathy, meaning it's more in relaxation, diastolic dysfunction rather than systolic. MR is the best modality 
to look at the myocardial pathology in amyloidosis and differentiate from other causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy and even constricted cardiomyopathy. The main differential you're thinking on echo is burned out HCM or long standing hypertension, glycogen storage disease, and MRI is very good to differentiate in that. It is very important and that you, because the main feature to look at amyloidosis and differentiating from the others is the late gadolinium enhancement. So it's very important to do an early late gadolinium enhancement in these patients at five minutes instead of 10 to 15 minutes, as previously described, or as we do routinely. The main reason is these patients have abnormal kinetics of gadolinium. So there is washout of gadolinium from the blood pool. It is very difficult to know the myocardium appropriately uh, because you have that washout of the blood pool and you have uptake in the myocardium. Normally, we see a concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic, diastolic and systolic dysfunction, diffuse late gadolinium enhancement, circumferential, or subendocardial, or both. T T1 mapping is usually abnormal as well. You get big atria and a thickened interventricular septum. You get delayed enhancement in the atrial wall as well, and the valves can be thickened. This is a patient with cardiac amyloidosis. On the left, you have in the top diastole and the bottom systole. You can see there's thickening of the myocardium, um, and there is not much decrease in lumen, so the systolic function is decreased, but there's also no relaxation, so it's diastolic systolic dysfunction. On the right side of images, you have the delayed enhancement, you can see how the blood pool is washed out. It's not as bright as we see. And there is diffuse uh, delayed enhancement. The only parts that are normal are these little uh, dark sleeves here. So this is a classic uh, amyloidosis. You can also show like this, diffuse subendocardium, delayed enhancement, wash out of the blood pool, very important feature. Another one, diffuse more my mid myocardial enhancement with wash out of the blood pool. The last cardiomyopathy we'll be talking about is sarcoidosis. We all know sarcoidosis is a systemic disease. Um, due to immune response, you have non caseating granuloma formation. It can also affect the heart in the endocardium, the muscle, the pericardium. The patients, usually with cardiac sarcoidosis, present with conduction abnormalities, the most common being a complete heart block. Uh, they can have ventricular tachycardia, which is the second most common presentation. They can have abnormalities of the cardiac valves. The most common valve is the mitral and it will be a regurgitation. And the second most common cause of death in this patient aside from the arrhythmias is congestive heart failure. So when the onsarcoidosis involved, the heart has a poor prognosis. It doesn't do it so often. About 5% of patients with clinical sarcoidosis have cardiac involvement which is higher at autopsy, about 25% of the patients who show those granulomas, but uh, clinically it's 5%. And usually when there's cardiac involvement, usually there is lung involvement. So that may be a clue as well. Uh, cardiac MRI with late lung enhancement is the most sensitive and specific non-invasive test evaluating these patients with suspected cardiac sarcoidosis. What we see in cardiac sarcoidosis is low motion abnormalities. You have myocardial edema um, and late gadolinium enhancement that involves basal, lateral segments, mostly mid myocardial or subepicardial, just like myocarditis. Um, it can also be subendocardial diffuse, kind of like more extensive myocarditis types. And the importance is also late gadolinium enhancement increases risk of my major cardiac event. Uh, and Sunday death. So again, it's important to diagnose the legal enhancement and quantify the extent of it. So patient with sarcoidosis in a four chamber horizontal long axis, two chamber vertical long axis. You can see in the lateral wall and inferior wall, you have these areas of myocardial thickening replacement by scar and granulomas. It's akinetic. It's not quite this kinetic yet. This is the delayed enhancement of a patient. You see how extensive delayed enhancement scar granuloma deposition is on that lateral wall. And interestingly, you can see here that it's transmural in the lateral and inferior wall. So it could potentially be confused with the transmural in, uh, ischemic infarction in the circumflex territory. But if you look at the other views, there is also patchy mid myocardium and involves other territories. So that will make you exclude 
um, ischemia. Also on the short axis, not so much, but on the uh, horizontal long axis, you can see that there is transmere at the base, but not so much more distally. If you had a central obstruction of the circumflex, it should be the entire territory be involved. So that's another clue. And these patients usually have uh, lung involvement. You can see the paralymphatic nodules. You can try to look at recent CTs. Uh, you may see the abnormal signal on MRI as well. And you can see lymphadenopathy, this patient with sarcoidosis. Uh, one last one that we touch base quickly is hemochromatosis because MRI plays a fundamental role. Uh, what happens is you can have the primary form of viral overload or you can have secondary hemochromatosis due to patients who have recurrent transfusion. Cardiac involvement is the most common cause of death with 50% of patients dying very young. So it's very important to look for them. What you see is high intensity areas in the myocardium from the iron that disrupts the magnetic field. And usually you see a high, uh, low signal intensity of the liver as well. So you have low signal intensity of the heart and liver. You have T2 star shortening from that field in homogeneity. Then we do T2 star calculation and you look at the values when the T2 star is very shortened, you confirm iron overload. This can be perceived before the patient presents with cardiomyopathy. So it's very important. We do follow up some patients that, are, that have hemochromatosis in other areas, we do cardiac MR to screen for this because this can be present before the systolic function is decreased by other methods. So this is how you do, you do the T2 star, uh, you do a map acquisition, you measure the myocardium T2 star time, which is milliseconds, and it's gonna be much, much lower uh, with that curve if you have higher deposition. And that's the only way to do this early diagnosis. With no other modality would be able to do that. So in summary, MRI plays a very important role in diagnose, diagnosis and prognosis of patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. It can help differentiate, it can help, uh, you diagnose the type, you differentiate the type, you look at the extension, you have prognostic values and you guide therapy such as um, ICD placement. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, such a wonderful talk and very uh, and beautiful imaging. Um, uh, I'd like to, I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Rubin for uh, his presentation as our next speaker. Dr. Rubin, please. I can't tell you uh, what a pleasure it is to be with all of you today uh, and to talk about acute aortic syndromes. Uh, as uh, Hart mentioned, my name is Jeff Rubin. I'm from Duke University. And let's dive right in. It's a big topic uh, and uh, a lot to cover here in the next 30 minutes. Uh, let's first uh, take this from the perspective of acute chest pain, which is obviously a very common uh, scenario that is encountered in, uh, in emergency rooms, 6 million ED visits in the U.S. per year. Most presentations of chest pain are, are non-life-threatening, and imaging has little role in those patients. Uh, the ED staff tends to be the biggest, biggest determinants of the positivity rates uh, for ED chest pain imaging uh, as they decide who gets the imaging. But it's good to just kind of have a perspective that there's all kinds of non-urgent causes of chest pain. Uh, I won't read all of these to you. They're listed here, uh, and uh, these uh, don't necessarily uh, require urgent imaging. Uh, but there are uh, five key urgent causes of chest pain acute coronary syndromes, acute aortic syndromes, pulmonary embolism, as well as tension pneumothorax, pericardial tamponade, and mediastinitis for esophageal rupture. That's actually six, not five. So uh, important to recognize that uh, beginning with a chest radiograph uh, offers an opportunity to uh, typically evaluate three of those conditions, uh, particularly the presence of pneumothorax uh, and the observation of pneumomediastinum, which might uh, suggest esophageal rupture, uh, cardiac silhouette uh, enlargement, suggesting pericardial tamponade, which should lead to echocardiography or perhaps a direct echocardiography in the setting of concerns for pericardial tamponade. So that leaves uh, sort of the big three cardiovascular causes of chest pain remaining, uh, acute coronary syndrome, acute aortic syndrome, and pulmonary embolism. And uh, CT plays a role in all three of these diagnoses to a variable extent with acute coronary syndrome, depending upon uh, the uh, protocols in your institution. 
But one feature uh, that is specific to acute aortic syndrome is, is there really are no uh, supplemental diagnostic tools that are used here. CT is the key tool for making the diagnosis and characterizing. And this is where we're going to be focusing today. Now, it's important to recognize that uh, the presence of pulmonary embolism uh, is not an uncommon finding, particularly in the ED population, but uh, even uh, amongst uh, patients that are having thoracic imaging for other causes. And so uh, when you see a small PE, it's best not to get tunnel vision. Uh, this is the same patient uh, that I was just showing you with a PE. And you can see that they actually also have a very large uh, ascending aortic aneurysm. Uh, and uh, that uh, aneurysm is associated with hemorrhage in the mediastinum uh, and, in fact, a subtle irregularity along the anterior wall. Uh, this patient actually, uh, in spite of what appears to be blood in the pericardium and the mediastinum, uh, was discharged from the ED on anticoagulants uh, because of their pulmonary embolism. Uh, and uh, it took us a couple of days to get the patient back in after we read the scan the next morning. Uh, and uh, I will show you that scan in a moment. Uh, this is just a volume rendering that shows you how some of the subtle surface contours can uh, sometimes be better displayed in this patient that is essentially having a rupturing uh, ascending aortic aneurysm. Uh, the patient uh, passed their stress test of anticoagulants, and here you can see they're back two days later, and you can see the progression of rupture of the ascending aorta in this case. Uh, but fortunately, uh, it has not uh, completely blown out as a contained rupture with pseudoaneurysm formation. Uh, here you can see now the volume rendering compared to before. And so a very important uh, PE is common. It can be incidental. Be sure to assess for acute aortic syndrome when it's suspected. In this case, uh, it was uh, ignored based on the PE finding. And fortunately, uh, the patient did not uh, die and was effectively treated upon return. So acute aortic syndromes are defined as urgent life-threatening conditions that typically present with chest pain and have a high risk of aortic rupture and sudden death. And classically, we talk about three conditions, aortic dissection, intramural hematoma, and penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Let's look at those in turn. Uh, aortic dissection is a disruption of the medial layer of the aorta with bleeding within and along the wall of the aorta resulting in separations of the layer of the aorta, and this represents about 80 to 90 percent of patients with acute aortic syndrome. Here you can see the appearance of a classic type A dissection. Type A dissections involve the ascending aorta, type B dissections do not. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, the ascending aorta is involved, and we can see uh, the, uh, what is called the intimal flap, or more appropriately, the intimal medial complex with an entry tear here. And then we see aneurysmal dilation of the descending aorta uh, with our false lumen uh, here and our true lumen here. OK, uh, now. Here is a patient who presents with acute chest pain uh, who was unresponsive uh, in their driveway uh, after the paramedics came to see them, uh, see, uh, to, uh, to bring them to the hospital. Uh, and what I want you to notice here is, is that uh, there is a fairly subtle uh, intimal uh, medial complex within the descending aorta here. Uh, let's actually see if I can pause this and get some control of it. Uh, and uh, I want to highlight to you, though, that the ascending aorta looks pretty good here. Uh, however, if I go down to the level of the root, you will see this intimal medial complex um, within the posterior uh, sinus of Valsalva here, the posterior cusp. So this is a dissection, but what's going on here? Where is the intimal medial complex? Well, it has completely sheared off and denuded the ascending aorta and is now uh, wadded up here uh, at the apex of the arch and essentially covering the supraortic branches. And you can see that the left common carotid and left subclavian arteries are getting no blood supply uh, directly from the aorta, and the intimal medial complex or flap is extending up into the uh, brachiocephalic artery and extending into the uh, right common carotid and right subclavian as well. Here's just a sagittal view showing you what that looks like, and you can see the very stark circumstance here uh, with the occlusion uh, of the left common carotid artery here uh, and this uh, 
essentially uh, extensive denuding of the ascending aorta with uh, blockage of those supraortic branches uh, by this wad of intimal tissue. Uh, this patient unfortunately died within uh, an hour of presenting to the hospital of massive cerebral infarction. Uh, and this is an illustration of one uh, of the uh, key complications that can be seen in the setting of type A dissection, namely a secession of blood flow through critical aortic branches. So it is important uh, to know that type A dissection, uh, by virtue of the fact that it involves the ascending aorta, requires urgent repair. Uh, and that is, is, number one, because there is an increased risk of aortic rupture uh, when the ascending aorta is involved, which can either lead out to a frank exsanguination uh, or a cardiac uh, pericardial tamponade. Uh, but it, as in this case, it can also result in arterial obstruction to the brain. Unfortunately for this patient, there was nothing uh, that could be done. The next uh, diagnosis is intramural hematoma. An intramural hematoma is defined as blood in the aortic wall and a clinical picture of dissection without identification of blood flow in a false lumen or an intimal lesion. Uh, and mechanisms have been proposed for IMH of vasovasorum rupture or microintimal tears. Uh, those uh, you'll find in the literature, but I'm going to uh, propose a whole different way to think about intramural hematoma in just a moment. But first, let's see what we're talking about here. Uh, intramural hematoma can be relatively subtle. And here, as we see on the contrast enhanced view uh, on the left, uh, that uh, the aortic wall appears thickened. Uh, and this can often be uh, misconstrued for mural thrombus or atheroma. But notice on the unenhanced scan that we have this crescent of high attenuation material, which actually represents the blood in the aortic wall. And you can see uh, another characteristic feature. This is a little piece of calcium uh, in the wall, which uh, normally um, would be uh, along the outer wall if this was atherosclerosis heaped up on top of the wall. But because this is intramural blood, the calcification gets displaced away. Uh, but you'll notice that in this particular patient, there are areas uh, of uh, mural thrombus and atheroma and other areas of intramural hematoma. In this case, the unenhanced scan is very useful uh, for showing the intramural blood, uh, which can be hard to see on the contrast enhanced scan. Here's another patient that has uh, an intramural hematoma. I'm showing the unenhanced scan, and you can see the crescent of high attenuation material uh, in the wall of the proximal descending aorta. Here on the contrast enhanced scan, you'll notice that what isn't appreciable on the unenhanced scan, and that is, is that this is beginning to break down, and we have a communication now that is beginning to occur between the true lumen of the aorta and what is soon to become a false lumen. And this is an illustration of one of the three common pathways that IMH will pursue over time, and that is, in this case, conversion toward a classic dissection. Here you can see in the same patient uh, the IMH proximally and then uh, beginning of conversion uh, to classic dissection distally. Uh, and just some static views uh, of what we were just uh, looking at. So the take home points here is that intramural hematoma has three primary outcomes. Under appropriate conditions, it can resolve spontaneously and resorb. That usually requires admission and uh, management of the patient on very, in a very hypotensive state. Uh, it can convert to classic dissection, as we're seeing in this instance here. Uh, and a third possibility is, is that uh, it can gradually progress to aneurysm formation. And those aneurysms usually tend to be fusiform in appearance. The third abnormality of acute aortic syndromes is penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Uh, these are pathologically defined as uh, focal outpouchings that extend through the internal elastic lamina, which of course is the uh, innermost layer of the aortic media uh, and separates the intima from the media. Uh, in a practical sense from imaging, we typically refer to a penetrating ulcer as one that we see extending beyond the adventitia because we cannot specifically identify the internal elastic lamina on a uh, CT scan. Uh, it may be associated with intramural hematoma. It may evolve into a frank aortic pseudoaneurysm and finding a localized narrow neck is the hallmark. And here is a nice example of a penetrating ulcer here, a very focal uh, outpouching here extending into the wall. 
Uh, and here you can see in this case, it is associated with intramural blood or intramural hematoma. So uh, I showed you this slide just a few moments ago and said that acute aortic syndromes essentially are represented by these three conditions. However, I want to present an alternative approach to thinking about uh, these and to put IMH into its own separate category and to indicate to you that aortic dissection and penetrating ulcer are pathologic lesions, but the presence of blood in the wall is not a pathology unto itself. It is simply a sign of instability of the wall. And in fact, there is a third pathology that we must bring in here in the setting of acute aortic syndromes, which is a rupturing thoracic aortic aneurysm. All three of these pathologies may be associated with intramural hematoma. And when they are associated with intramural hematoma, it is an indication of progression of disease um, and instability of the aorta. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. Uh, but it's useful to contextualize these three pathologies by virtue of the area of the aortic wall that is involved. In aortic dissection, it's primar primarily an abnormality of the media. In penetrating ulcer, it is primarily an abnormality beginning in the intima. And then rupturing aneurysms uh, are typically transmural phenomena. And then the IMH is just the presence of stagnant blood, acute blood in the wall. So let's see how this works out from a practical standpoint. Here is a patient with a descending aortic aneurysm, and I'm showing you an unenhanced scan on the left and an enhanced scan on the right. And let me just uh, grab this here and get some control. And conveniently, I've stopped it at a great point. This is just below the aneurysm. And what I want you to notice on the unenhanced scan is the high attenuation intramural hematoma, the blood in the wall, as well as the high attenuation blood that is in the middle mediastinum. Now, let's just sort of go up to the top a moment and notice high attenuation material in the pleural space. As we come down, we see lower attenuation material. We'll look at that on an alternative view in a moment. Uh, but here is our aneurysm, fairly homogeneously displayed. You'll notice that there is mural thrombus, which is thrombus that collects within the lumen of the aorta, lining the aneurysm. That is different from what we see at its distal most extent, which is this intramural hematoma. Notice the calcifications displaced toward the lumen uh, that we talked about, which is the hallmark of indicating a collection within the wall as opposed to being within the lumen. And here is the point of rupture right here, where we see this trail of blood coming from the aorta uh, and then progressing into the mediastinum and then flowing all the way up into this uh, hematoma within the pleural space. And here is a oblique reformation that nicely shows you that at the margin of the aneurysm is the area where the intramural hematoma has formed. Here is the point of rupture right here um, with a bleeding into the mediastinum and then this trail of blood uh, through this uh, medial gutter of the pleural space and this large hematoma at the apex of the left hemithorax with more simple pleural fluid and atelectasis of the middle and lower lobes of the lung. So this is an example of intramural hematoma as a characteristic of rupturing aortic aneurysm. So intramural hematoma indicates aneurysm instability and may herald frank rupture, which is certainly present in this case. Now, um, let us uh, consider when we are performing a CT angiogram, what qualities do we seek in order to make the right characterization and the right observations. Number one, we need to have adequate arterial enhancement in all lumina present. And by all lumina, I mean true and false lumina when, they're when there is a dissection. We need to be able to visualize acute hemorrhage when it's present in the wall or outside of the wall. We also need to be able to measure the size of the aorta, which can uh, be an important determinant uh, determinant of whether the patient needs urgent uh, therapy or not, and then look for uh, critical branch extension as well. These are sort of characteristics uh, that need to be uh, present, and uh, we could unpack 
how the scan is protocoled uh, and uh, performed in order to achieve this, but unfortunately, um, we don't quite have time to do that today. Um, we do have time, though, to look at uh, some more cases, and that's what's really important here. Now, let me show you another uh, circumstance, and that is, is that uh, in the setting of aortic dissection, it is very important to understand that this is a disease that, although it almost always begins in the thoracic aorta, can have its most important extension and involvement distal to the ascending and involve the abdominal aorta and iliac arteries. What we see here is a type B dissection involving the descending aorta, and we can see that there is a large entry tear right here, dist distal to the left subclavian artery. And we have this wadded up uh, intimal medial complex here, um, which uh, in fact uh, appears on a sagittal view as if uh, we have a nice normal aortic lumen. The dimension of the descending aorta looks good. Uh, and other than this little focal abnormality here, we might consider uh, that uh, this patient just has uh, a localized uh, intimal lesion and uh, dissection. However, uh, this patient presented um, with a cold leg uh, and was aneuric. And here is what we see at the proximal abdominal aorta. I want you to see carefully here that there is this thickening of the wall from about the four o'clock to the nine o'clock position posteriorly. And that is because there are two layers of intima completely collapsed posteriorly. This is all false lumen anteriorly. The true lumen is completely collapsed. And that can result in a phenomenon called the malperfusion syndrome. In this particular case, we have complete true luminal collapse. And because the renal arteries originate from the true lumen, uh, there is no blood getting to the renal arteries and no blood getting to the kidneys. This patient was a neuric, as I mentioned. Moreover, with the cold leg, what we can see is, is that complete true luminal collapse posteriorly of the abdominal aorta, false luminal filling down to the proximal common iliac, uh, and then the dissection ends. Uh, and in this particular instance, this is true lumen, uh, but there is no blood getting in. There's a little collateralization from a uh, contralateral supply, which is uh, allowing some opacification of the femoral artery in this particular case, but it was insufficient. This patient had sky-high myoglobin levels, an ischemic leg, uh, was, uh, as I mentioned, aneuric, and despite heroic attempts to try to open these branches in the cath lab, this patient died four hours after presentation. This is an example of a type B e dissection with a very dire complication of the malperfusion syndrome. It typically occurs when there is a very large entry tear uh, and very few exit tears. And when blood uh, is uh, forced through that entry tear into the false lumen, uh, the false lumen expands and it collapses the true lumen. Uh, and then uh, blood is not allowed to pass into the true lumen uh, until uh, there is a therapeutic maneuver typically a stent graft to cover that entry tear and redirect the blood flow back down into uh, the true lumen. So for suspected aortic dissection, very important to not just scan the chest, but to scan the abdomen and pelvis as well to assure that there is not critical involvement of the uh, abdominal vessels or abdominal viscera. Now, I've uh, alluded to the value of unenhanced scans when performing uh, CTA, and uh, this is an article that nicely talks about that. Uh, in this particular case, the question was, is could an unenhanced scan be eliminated um, from CT angiography when uh, there is concern for intramural hematoma? Uh, and in this particular study uh, of 36 patients, um, what was found was in fact that uh, it was important to have an unenhanced scan, that the diagnostic performance was inferior for a single phase versus a dual phase where uh, the first phase is unenhanced and the second phase is uh, uh, with contrast. Uh, the unenhanced phase allows discrimination of intramural hematoma uh, from uh, atheroma, from aortitis, better characterization of atheroma. Uh, it helps to distinguish acute versus chronic penetrating ulcer as well. So both extension of the scan into the abdomen and pelvis and the use of unenhanced scans are important protocol considerations uh, to bring in mind uh, when we are assessing acute aortic syndrome. All right, here's another case. And here we can see that this is a patient um, with a 
aortic dissection. Uh, and in this particular case, this uh, patient presented with chest pain and had a known aortic dissection. Let me see if I can get that going again here and just put that on pause. And I just want to show you it is involving the ascending aorta. So it's a type A dissection. Uh, but the question is, is what is possibly uh, the cause of the acute pain? Uh, and there doesn't appear to be any leaking here, any blood in the mediastinum. But let's take a note of the proximal extent of the ascending aorta. Here we can see some weak enhancement of the false lumen, but as we go more proximally, we see no enhancement here. And the question is, is okay, what's, uh, what's going on there? Is it just uh, that the contrast hasn't quite reached that point? Uh, is this something chronic? Well, here is the unenhanced scan, and here is the value of that unenhanced scan in a slightly different way from the other cases I've shown you. Notice that we don't see the dissection, we don't see the flowing portions of the false lumen, but as I go proximally, notice that you do see the crescent of high attenuation material here in the ascending aorta. And this is basically an intramural hematoma now that is associated with proximal propagation of the dissection. So in this particular instance, this pre-existing dissection uh, is now extending prograde, or I should say retrograde, into uh, the ascending aorta. And we have this subtle intramural hematoma, um, which is an indication, again, of instability uh, and something that needs to be observed and attended to through uh, at least admission uh, and uh, very careful monitoring. So the take-home point here is that dissection can progress retrograde as an intramural hematoma, uh, and the unenhanced scan facilitates the identification of this acute blood within the wall. Another patient here presenting with chest pain, and in this particular case, um, we see a descending thoracic aortic aneurysm. Uh, we don't see evidence of rupture here. Maybe there's a small left pleural effusion. There's a little atelectasis within the uh, left lower lobe. Uh, we have an irregular contour here, but there's chest pain. What's going on? Let's look at that unenhanced scan now in association with it. And uh, let me just stop right here and show you that there is intramural hematoma associated with this aneurysm. Notice that in the main part of the aneurysm where there's all of this irregular thrombus lining the aneurysm, that it is not visible on the unenhanced scan. But as we come up high, here is at the margin that crescent. I showed you a case of a rupturing aneurysm already with a intramural hematoma uh, that uh, had frankly ruptured. This is an impending rupture. If you see an intramural hematoma in the setting of an aortic aneurysm, it is urgent uh, that the patient uh, is admitted uh, and is observed very carefully uh, and uh, potentially uh, uh, treated either uh, with blood pressure lowering medications or possibly a stent graft if appropriate. Here's that telltale calcification displaced toward the lumen indicating the intramural hematoma. IMH is a sign of rupturing aortic aneurysm. Now here is the biggest aneurysm that I have ever seen in my career, the biggest thoracic aortic aneurysm, and it's a true aneurysm, 16 centimeters of ascending aorta, completely uh, crunching and collapsing the superior vena cava here, collapsing the right lung, uh, but there's no IMH, there's no blood, this is not rupturing, this is a stable lesion. Uh, this patient was admitted and then operated on several days later electively. All right, now let's take a look at one last detail here as we come toward uh, the end of this uh, talk on acute aortic syndromes. And that is, is that uh, uh, sometimes the ascending aorta can be a very difficult area to assess when there's a lot of artifact. Now here you can see uh, in this hypertensive man presented with diffuse chest, back and neck pain, a transthoracic echo that didn't show dissection, but people were worried. Uh, and you can see there's a little pericardial fluid here, but look at this ascending aorta, and I'll show you several sections here. We can see uh, that there appears to be a linear filling defect, maybe on both sides. And, and this can be confusing to people. Is this dissection? Is this motion artifact? And in uh, this particular case, um, there was really nothing seen other than uh, that uh, irregularity. And uh, there was discomfort on the fact that uh, 
There is no direct aortic lesion visualized, although there does seem to be blood, uh, blood or pericardial fluid at least, and the patients uh, had symptoms that weren't explained just by a little bit of aortic enlargement. Plus, the ED docs were convinced that this might represent dissection. So uh, the next morning, the patient came back for an ECG-gated scan. And notice how much clearer the root looks. And it is very nice that it shows that all of this is just artifact from aortic motion. But it also shows us something else. There is blood in the mediastinum. And here is a very subtle horizontal tear of the ascending aorta. This is a limited dissection, is what it's called, a very focal intimal lesion. And so motion-related artifacts in the ascending aorta can mimic or mask dissection. ECG gating reduces artifacts and provides a clearer depiction. Let's look at one more case of the value proposition of ECG gating. This is a, car, uh, a vascular surgeon, as it turns out, who was uh, skiing uh, and experienced acute chest pain. Uh, he put his hands on his uh, groins and palpated asymmetric femoral pulses, and so he presented to a nearby hospital and said, I have an aortic dissection. Uh, they did uh, a uh, non-gated uh, CT angiogram. Uh, they did not specifically time their injection, and so that was actually uh, uh, a problem uh, for the contrast enhancement up proximally. Actually, let me just go back a second here. Uh, and, uh, that video doesn't seem to be working. That's okay. Here you can see that the patient is right. They do have an aortic dissection here. Uh, there is dilation. There's a lot of motion here and a lot of movement. So the patient was rushed to the operating room. And in the operating room uh, with this type A dissection, uh, they put in an ascending aortic interposition graft. And because the dissection was extending right to the aortic root, they transplanted the right and left coronary arteries and attached them to that interposition graft. However, after they discontinued cardiopulmonary bypass, they observed anterior myocardial ischemia. Uh, they just saw that the heart was not receiving blood. They performed an emergency bypass graft from the brachiocephalic artery origin to the LAD, closed the patient up, and the next morning sent the patient down for us to have a look. And here is the CT angiogram the next morning. Here's the graft here. Uh, and uh, let's just look at some details uh, from it here. Here is a volume rendering that shows the extent of that interposition graft, the transplanted right coronary artery, which is getting its blood supply nicely here, uh, the implanted uh, graft to the brachiocephalic phallic going down uh, to the uh, LAD. Uh, but here, now that we have done this with ECG gating, we have the opportunity to view this right here, which is a filling defect that is present within the distal left anterior descending coronary artery and uh, blocking flow uh, distally. Here you can see, here is the uh, LAD with a filling defect. Here's a curry formation uh, nicely showing this blood clot. This is sequela of intracoronary extension of the intimal dissection um, with associated uh, clot and uh, secondary myocardial ischemia. So very important to be aware that intracoronary extension of dissection is a source of morbidity and mortality, uh, particularly in dissections that extend into the aortic root and should be uh, considered uh, in patients uh, that uh, have aortic root involvement. ECG gating is critical for its identification. So let's summarize this uh, talk with a few brief uh, take-home points. IMH, it's a sign of acuity associated with all acute aortic syndromes, namely dissection, penetrating ulcer, and rupturing aortic aneurysm. Unenhanced scans are your friend. They improve detection of hemorrhage in the aortic wall. Always include the abdomen and pelvis when you suspect dissection because it frequently involves those uh, regions gate for suspected ascending aortic involvement, uh, you'll have a better depiction of the ascending aorta and uh, be able to detect intracoronary extension. So that brings us right to the top of the hour. And I want to thank everybody uh, for sticking with us and hearing this. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it back over to Harp. Thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. Uh, a really wonderful talk, really beautiful images again from both speakers today and some uh, uh, really important take home points for the residents. So uh, we are at the top of the hour. I'd like to thank everybody for joining our session. And again, thank you to both of our amazing speakers. Uh, and we will see you again in the uh, session next week.
uh, be well and um, uh, have a great weekend.